We're here in John chapter 12 and also Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11 is somewhat indirectly related, at least to the topic of our story today. But a little background before we read first from John chapter 12 and then from Matthew chapter 11. The last week of Jesus' life leading up to his crucifixion is what is commonly referred to as Passion Week. It is so named because Jesus passionately and willingly laid down his life for the sins of the world when he went to the cross. Today marks the first day of Passion Week, which is traditionally called Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday is so named because on the Sunday uh, before the crucifixion of Christ, Jesus comes into Jerusalem riding on a donkey and people line the streets waving palm branches in celebration of Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem. Now, there's a reason why they're doing this, and we'll discuss this as we go through the text this morning. But let's first start here in John chapter 12 and read, starting at verse 12 down through verse 16. John 12, 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the feast, that is the feast of Passover, heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat upon it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, O daughter of Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him. Now, if you would, jump to Matthew chapter 11, if you have that place marked also. Matthew chapter 11, I'm going to read the first six verses. After Jesus had finished instructing his 12 disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in the towns of Galilee. When John, this is John the Baptist, <clears throat> when John heard in prison what Christ was doing, he sent his disciples to ask him, are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? Jesus replied, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. Blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. Let's pause there and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the time now that we gather here, opening up your word, being reminded of, or maybe for some people hearing it for the first time, the story of Palm Sunday and your entrance into Jerusalem. And Lord, we look forward to celebrating your resurrection from the dead next weekend. And this week, we pray, God, that you would help us to be mindful of your great sacrifice and the price that you paid for us. And your agony and suffering that you endured on our behalf because of your love for us. And we just in response wanna say, Lord, that we love you and we thank you for meeting us here today. Use your word now to speak to our hearts. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and everyone said, amen. In this story here, we'll start back in John chapter 12. In this story here, which is this Palm Sunday story, you have here the beginning of this week of Passion Week and what we find here in the story in John 12 is that people are enthusiastic about Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem. They're waving palm branches and they're celebrating the fact that Jesus has come. Why are they so enthusiastic? Answer, because they see him as Messiah. They recognize him as the long-awaited Messiah, the one that the prophets of old had been speaking of for hundreds of years before Christ. Now, we know that they understand that Jesus is Messiah by the way that they speak of him. In the story, in John 12, they say Hosanna, which is an Aramaic word that means save. So they see him as deliverer, and they're shouting Hosanna as he's coming into Jerusalem. They're waving palm branches. They also ascribe to him the title of King of Israel, also there in John 12. They call him the King of Israel. They see him as our deliverer, Messiah, the King who's come. And then they say, also in the text, blessed is the King of Israel, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're quoting from Psalm 118. Now, Psalm 118 was a messianic psalm. 
Psalm 118 was written in anticipation prophetically of the Messiah. So when they quote from Psalm 118 and ascribe it unto Jesus, they are clearly seeing him as Messiah. Hosanna the Deliverer, King of Israel, and they quote Psalm 118. The problem is, though, that while they see him as Messiah, they've recognized him correctly in terms of his identity, but they have incorrectly recognized his mission. They see him as Messiah, but they've incorrectly recognized his mission. They see Jesus as Savior, make no mistake about it, but not in the sense that he is, his mission was really about. His mission was about saving them from their sinful condition. What they had in their heads was saving us from Roman oppression. This is first century. This is the Roman Empire. The Jewish people are part of the Roman Empire at this time because the Roman Empire includes Israel. And the people are oppressed. The people are overtaxed. The people are tired of the heavy hand of Caesar. They see Jesus coming into Jerusalem. They recognize he's our Messiah. We've heard his teaching. We've seen his miracles. We know he's the one that the prophets have foretold. Ah, yeah, but they overlook things like Psalm 22, which David would write prophetically a thousand years before Christ was born that spoke about his crucifixion in detail. And they overlooked Isaiah 53 which Isaiah the prophet 700 years before Christ was born spoke about how the Messiah would die for the sins of the world. In Isaiah 53 verse 6, it talks about how we, we all like sheep have gone astray. Each has turned to his own way and the Lord has laid on him, Messiah Jesus, the iniquity of us all. You see, the idea of Savior, what they had in mind, Savior from oppressive Rome. The idea of Savior, what God had in mind, was saving people from their sinful condition. And what happened was, when their idea of Messiah did not line up with mission of Messiah, they rejected Messiah altogether. This is what happens in our story. The very same people who are shouting Hosanna and hailing Jesus as King on Palm Sunday by the end of the week will be referring to him as criminal. The very same people who are shouting Hosanna at the beginning of the week by the end of the week are going to shout crucify him. Now why? Because their idea and their concept and their expectation of Messiah did not line up with Messiah's mission. What they had in their head was not what God intended when Christ came into Jerusalem to die for the sins of the world, and because mission and Messiah did not match, they dismiss him altogether, and they end up killing him. That's how far they go from hailing him as king to killing him as criminal in a matter of one short week. The title of my sermon today is Unmet Expectations. And the subtitle to the sermon is, What do you do when God doesn't do what you think he should do? Because this is a question all of us at some point will wrestle with in the course of our lives. Where the idea of what we hope God will do, think God will do, expect God to do, does not line up with reality sometimes. And it's no reflection on God to disparage him in some way, like God didn't hold up to his end of the deal, but just the fact of the matter is that in life there are times when our concept of what Messiah is going to do, hope to do, we think Jesus will do, does not always line up with what he actually does. And then in that moment we have to wrestle with what do we do when God doesn't do what we think he should do. You see, whenever we, and I'm talking about on any relational level, not just in our relationship with God, but on any relational level, whenever we have a certain desire in our head or in our heart, and it doesn't match what is actually delivered, it's unmet expectations. Now, sometimes that can be because what we desire is unrealistic. Sometimes 
we put on people or expect out of people something that's not really realistic. We have it in our head, we've gotten ourselves all worked up for it, but maybe on our part, it's not really realistic. On the other hand, it could also be that what's delivered is unsatisfactory and, and, and that you know, maybe somebody promised and then they let you down and so whatever, and it can be a combination of both. It can be over-expectant and under-delivered, but whatever it is, or a combination of both, it ends up creating a lot of discouragement. A lot of discouragement. Somebody's always discouraged when desire and delivery don't meet. And it happens on every level of relationships. Those of you who are married, you understand how this works. You, you have certain expectations of your spouse and they don't deliver and maybe your expectation was too high, maybe their delivery was unsatisfactory, I, I don't know. But you know, a lot of people, they go into marriage, you know, I just love to see the wide-eyed wonder of newlyweds when they first get married. They're like, oh, this, this, is, like, this is like Cinderella and Prince Charming. And then after five years, they realize it's another Disney film. It's really Beauty and the Beast. You know what I'm saying to you? <laughs> and expectations happen like that. And, and unmet expectations can lead to a lot of disappointment, a lot of discouragement. And it happens not just in marriage. I mean, family, friends, coworkers. Listen, wherever you have relationships with people, you run the risk of having unmet expectations. It happens. Friends, family, co-workers, I remember just the other night, just the other night. So Terry and I were over at Tyler's house and, and, his, and his wife Kayla, and we're, we're in the living room and we're talking, and I said, hey, Tyler, Tyler, I came across something this week that you'll love. Now, here's what happened. Earlier in the week, in my desk drawer at home, I came upon a savings bond, a U.S. savings bond that was issued in his name by his great-grandfather, uh, Terry's grandfather, on the day that Tyler was born. Now, Tyler's 28, and so I looked up on the savings bond and realized that it matures after 30 years. So in another year and a half, it comes to full maturity, you can cash a thing in. So I actually went online, I thought, maybe I can figure out how much this thing is worth. Now, it's a $50 savings bond. I went online, there's actually this place you can go, enter the serial number, date it was issued, and it'll tell you what its value is to date. So I did that, and I found out the value. Okay, now I had it in my head because I knew what the value was. So I say to Tyler, we're at his house, like, Tyler, your great-grandfather gave you this U.S. savings bond almost 30 years ago. In about a year and a half, it's gonna come to full maturity. You're gonna be able to cash this. Now, I admit, I, I kind of probably was a little more enthusiastic than I should have been. <laughs> but his eyes got wide-eyed like dinner plates. And he's, and he's just like, holy smokes, you know. And I said, and that value, it was originally a $50 gift, you know, savings bond, and it's worth today $98. <laughs> he fell on the ground laughing hysterically. He said, Dad, Dad, I thought you were going to tell me it was like a down payment on a house. <laughs> See, I had in my head 98 bucks. He had in his head 9800 bucks, you know, and, and it just wasn't reality. And so I kind of, you know, gave this kind of false hope and he had this, you know, expectation and the two collided and then there was disappointment. It was humorous disappointment, but it was disappointment. Now, it's one thing to have unmet expectations between family members, friends, husbands, wives. It's a whole other thing to have unmet expectations with God. What do you do when God doesn't do what you think he should do? How do you handle that sense of disappointment? What, what, what do you do when you feel like God has let you down in some way? Well, in order to kind of see some counsel from Scripture on this, I, I want to also point out to you the other story that we read at the beginning of our study, which is Matthew chapter 11. If you want to turn your Bibles now to Matthew 11, because I'm going to refer to that a little bit here. Um, on your way to Matthew 11, let me just refer to John's gospel a little bit because the first person who recognized Jesus' true identity as Messiah was John the Baptist. A lot of people think it was, it was Peter, you know, at, at Caesarea Philippi, you know, who do men say that I am? You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. Oh, that's… But it actually wasn't Peter, it wasn't the first one, it was John the Baptist. Because in John chapter 1, verse 29, it says, 
that John the Baptist saw Jesus coming and he announced to everybody, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. But John the Baptist clearly understood that Jesus is Messiah. He came as a sacrifice, the Lamb of God, to take away the sins of the world. Further down in John 1.34, John the Baptist even goes further and says, I have seen and I testify that he is the Son of God. So John the Baptist clearly understood Jesus as Messiah. But when you get here to Matthew chapter 11, the text we read earlier, he in verse 3 sends a couple of his disciples, because everybody in that day, if you were a rabbi or a prophet, and, and, and John the Baptist was, you have your own little group of followers. So he sends two of his followers, two of his disciples to Jesus with this question. It's there in Matthew 11 verse 3. Are you the one who was to come? Or should we expect somebody else? Now, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. John the Baptist, you're a good Baptist. Come on. How can you go from proclaiming that he's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world in John 1, and that he's the Son of God in John 1, and get here to Matthew 11, verse 3, and question, are you, are you the Messiah? Because I, I kind of thought you were, but I'm not even sure right now. Are you the one who was to come, or should we expect someone else? And John the Baptist sends a couple of his disciples to ask Jesus that question. What happened between, oh, he's the Lamb of God and the Son of God, to, are you the one? Are you, are you the one who was to come? I'll tell you what happened in between those verses. Prison. Prison for John the Baptist. You see, in the text there in Matthew 11, it says, from prison, John sent some of his disciples to go ask Jesus, are you the one who was to come or should we expect someone else? See, what we know by this time in Matthew chapter 11 is that John the Baptist had been a year in prison at this point. He was thrown in prison by Herod Antipas, the son of Herod the Great. Herod Antipas was living in adultery and John the Baptist called him out. Said, you stole your brother Philip's wife and you made her your wife. You're living in sin. It's adultery. And Herod Antipas didn't like to hear that. So in order to shut him up, he put him in prison. And history says he's at a prison called Machairus, down by the Dead Sea. On a map today, it would be the Jordanian side of the Dead Sea. And there John the Baptist is. He's been there a year now. You know what prison will do to you? Now listen, he's not done anything wrong. John the Baptist has just told the truth, and for that he gets thrown in prison. He will soon have his head cut off as a gift that, that Herod Antipas gives to his stepdaughter for dancing at a dinner party. So his life's coming to an end, and he knows it. And he's stuck in prison for a year. Not that he's done anything, except told the truth. And a year in prison, you got a lot of time to think. He starts thinking. He starts rolling things over in his head. And the reality is that the reason why he questions whether Jesus really is the Messiah is because of unmet expectations. He's in prison, and he's thinking to himself, this isn't how it was supposed to work. You know, if Jesus really is Savior and Messiah, why hasn't he sprung me out of jail by now? You know, why am I here? This is not, you ever thought this kind of question? This is not how I expected life to turn out. This is not what I thought. I didn't expect to be here. I didn't think I'd find myself in this situation. Ever thought that? Because that's exactly what John the Baptist is thinking, and that's why it even causes him to doubt a little bit. I'm not even sure Jesus is, is the one. Now, when Jesus replies to John the Baptist, says to the disciples, take this message back to them. He says something that I think is an important point for those of us who really need to know what, what to do when God doesn't do what we think he should do. And the first one is this, look for what he is doing rather than for what he is not doing. Look for what he is, so many times we can get fixated on what God's not doing, especially that one thing God didn't do this one thing. Let me tell you something. I'm not trying to diminish your pain because sometimes that one thing can be extremely, extremely difficult. But I just want to say to you in all love, you will miss all the other wonderful things God is doing if all you do is see what he's not doing. 
because I want you to notice Jesus' response. It's Matthew 11, verse 4. Jesus said, go back and report to John what you hear and see. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is preached to the poor. I want you to go back. I want you to tell John what God is doing because this is the evidence that he's still at work. You know how true this is? It's human nature for us to look at what's missing instead of what's present. You know how it is that we don't appreciate something until it's gone? Because we're often so fixed on what is missing, we don't even see what's present. We're fixed on the loss instead of the gain. We're fixed on the negative instead of the positive. And this is, by the way, a terrible thing, not just in our relationship with God. It happens in, it happens in marriages all the time. People, people can get fixed on a spouse in terms of what they don't do, how they don't measure up, how they have not done something right, and miss all the other wonderful things about them. It's, it's a really terrible thing about human hearts. <clears throat> we can get really fixed on just what somebody doesn't do right or what somebody doesn't do at all instead of what they do right and what they do well and the other things that they do. And we can treat God the same way. And I think in the process we miss, we miss all the other wonderful things. I'm gonna say something that I, I hope won't offend anyone, but it was something that was shared to me years ago after family had tragically lost one of their children. One of the other surviving children came to me and said, I don't feel like I exist anymore because all mom and dad see is the child who's not here anymore. We can sometimes, because of our pain, miss the other wonderful gifts of God and the other wonderful things that he's doing because of the one thing that's missing or the one thing we are disappointed he hasn't done. Look for what he is doing. Look and see the grace of God and the wonder of God and the goodness of God in all the many other ways in your life. You might be surprised what you've been missing. The second thing I think is important for us to see in this story, and I'm gonna use this phrase Fall forward, don't fall away. Because Jesus, in his response to John's disciples, said, go back and tell John this. He adds there in Matthew 11, verse 6, blessed is the man who does not fall away on account of me. That is one of the most staggering verses in all of the Bible to me. That Jesus actually anticipates some will be so disappointed with him because he doesn't do what they think he should do, that they actually may fall away on account of Jesus. And he anticipates this. And he knows this is something John the Baptist is struggling with. That's why part of the message, he says, go back and tell John this. Blessed are those who don't fall away on account of me. So I've adopted this phrase, fall forward. Because what tends to happen is, whenever in life we face a disappointment, we wanna run from the source of that disappointment. So what happens often is when we feel like God has let us down because he didn't do what we think he should do, we tend to, the default naturally is I want to run from God. I want to fall away from God. I want to pull away from him because we think somehow in avoiding him, we can then avoid the discouragement. The problem is the discouragement still, still goes with us. You can't outrun the disappointment or the discouragement. The irony is... The irony is that the one that we're disappointed with because God didn't do what we hoped he would do is the very one and only one who can really minister to the disappointment of our heart. So what happens is when God doesn't show up the way we hoped he would, we could tend to, if we're not careful, we could tend to get angry, we can tend to get bitter. By the way, God's a big God. He can take your emotion if you are. But what I'm saying is but then we get bitter, we get angry at God, and then we kind of pull away from God. But the problem is the only one who can deal with the anger and bitterness of our soul is God himself. Fall forward. Don't fall away. Run to him. I know it may not always make sense, but 
We need to run to the one who can help us in our time of need. Listen, this is, this is a story of Ted Turner's life. Most of you might know who Ted Turner is. Ted Turner now is a multi-billionaire. His net worth is $2.3 billion. Ted Turner, now 79 years of age, founder of CNN, media mogul, was on the cover of Time magazine back in the 90s as man of the year, been married and divorced three times. What a lot of people don't know about Ted Turner, Ted Turner is very outspoken in his disdain for Christianity. What most people don't know is that Ted Turner, as a child, was a Christian, made a profession of faith, and wanted to be a missionary when he grew up. What happened was his little sister developed a rare form of lupus. And this particular rare form of lupus caused brain damage and constant, such agonizing pain, she would just scream for hours on end. And eventually she died at the age of 12. Ted Turner prayed for her every day, and she never got better. And his own story he said this, quote, she was sick for five years before she passed away, and it just seemed so unfair because she hadn't done anything wrong. What had she done wrong? And I couldn't get any answers. Christianity couldn't give me any answers to that, so my faith got shaken somewhat, end quote. Well, if you've ever heard Ted Turner talk, I mean, that's the understatement of the year. I mean, his faith got shaken more than somewhat. He once said out loud that he hoped the Pope would step on a landmine, and he once said, quote, Christianity is a religion for losers, end quote. But what happened with Ted Turner is that his pain shaped his view of God. And so when he couldn't make sense of something, and there's a lot this side of heaven we just won't make sense of, okay? When he couldn't make sense of it, it shaped his view of God, and his view of God was such that he wanted to run from God, not toward God. So he fell away rather than forward. What we need to be about, I don't share that story to shame Ted Turner. There's a lot of Ted Turners in our world who have gone through very painful things. But what I would encourage the Ted Turners of the world to do is to fall forward to God, to basically just cry out to God and say, God, I don't understand this. I don't like it. I'm angry. I'm hurt. I'm upset. God, I'm in a lot of pain. But I believe that there's no one else and nowhere else to turn besides you. And that you're the source of all that is good and right, even though I don't understand this. And I trust that somehow you will accomplish your purpose in my pain because there's nowhere else to run and no one else to turn to. You're my rock. You're my redeemer. That's falling forward. That's saying, God, I don't get this and I don't like it. I'm even angry about it. But I have nowhere else to turn. Blessed, Jesus said, are those who don't fall away on account of me. God has disappointed you. Don't fall away from him. Run towards him. Fall forward. Last thing, and then we're going to close with prayer. Hold on to eternity. In our original story of John chapter 12, in verse 16, it says, the disciples did not understand all this. What's all this Hosanna stuff? What's all the celebration? Even the crucifixion really made no sense to them. They thought Jesus was dead and not coming back. It says, only after Jesus was glorified, did they realize that these things had been written about him and that they had done these things to him? Jesus rises from the dead, ascends back into heaven. That's the glorification of Jesus. It wasn't until Jesus was glorified that the disciples were able to make a little sense of all of this because life is much more clear in the rearview mirror than it is in the present. And they were able to look backwards and sew things together to make more sense of it. But it wasn't until Jesus was glorified. Jesus ascended back into heaven. Sometimes, sometimes thing on, things on earth won't make sense without the light of eternity. So hold on to eternity. Because right now it looks like a confusing mess sometimes. But eternity will make better sense. You know, life is somewhat like a quilt, the underside of a quilt. You know, you've seen the other si underside of a quilt, which is just a bunch of zigzag threads, a bunch of knots, and, you know, doesn't look very pretty. The beauty is on the other side. So sometimes in life, it just, it just looks like this crazy, zigzagged, confusing mess of knots. The beauty's on the other side. Right now, we, we don't see it all clearly, but one day, 
it'll make more sense. I'm gonna close with this story. This illustration actually came out of a book that Max Lucado wrote called In the Eye of the Storm. I encourage if any of you are going through some difficulty, pick up that book, In the Eye of the Storm. In that book, Lucado uses this illustration. He says, there was a poor man who lived in a village and his only source of income was cutting down wood in the forest and hauling it to the village so that the people of the village could buy wood from him. But he did have this prized, precious horse that helped him to haul wood out of the forest. He was so poor, though, that the people of the village came to him and said, you ought to sell that horse, and then you'll have more money for yourself. Sell that horse. The man said, I couldn't sell this horse. It's like a part of my family. I couldn't sell the horse. One day, the horse was missing. The people of the village came to the, the poor old man and say, see, old man, you should have listened to us. Now you don't have the horse to sell. You're cursed. The horse has been stolen. The man said, say not that the horse has been stolen, only that the, that the horse is missing from the stall, for we only see a fragment of the story. A few days later, the horse came back. The horse came back leading 12 other wild horses from the forest. <laughs> the people of the village came to the man and said, you were right, we were wrong. You're a blessed man, not a cursed man, for this horse has brought back 12 with it. He said, don't say that I'm a blessed man or a cursed man. Say only that the horse was missing and now has returned with 12 more. After that, the man's son was trying to break the horses that were wild. In the process, he fell off one of the horses, broke both his legs. The people of the village rushed to the man's house. You're a cursed man. We were right, you were wrong. For your son has fallen off the horse and broken both his legs, you're cursed. The poor man said, do not say that I am cursed or that I am blessed, but simply state that my son fell off the horse and broke both his legs, for we only see a fragment of the story. Shortly thereafter, the nation that they lived in went to war with the neighboring nation, and all the men of the village were drafted into war, except this man's son, because he had broken both his legs. <laughs> the people of the village rushed to his house. You were right. We were wrong. You are a blessed man. For your son broke both his legs, and now he couldn't be drafted into war. He said, say neither that I am blessed nor cursed, but just that my son was not drafted into the war. For we only see a small fragment of the story understand? Sometimes life, it's a zigzagged mess underneath the quilt. But we only see a small fragment of the story. And I believe that God wants to just minister to some of you that have been deeply disappointed, some unmet expectations in life, that God wants to minister to you today. So in a moment, Ben's gonna come, he's gonna sing. And when he starts to sing, I'm gonna ask if you want prayer for you just to slip out of your seats and come forward. This is not a prayer for salvation. This is a prayer for God's ministering grace to your hearts. And if it applies to you, great. If you wanna come forward, fine. I'm gonna pray for all those who are here. If you don't, it's okay. But I just don't wanna leave here without giving an opportunity for the Lord just to minister his grace to our hearts. Life is sometimes confusing and disappointing, but we only see one small fragment. And I'm going to trust with you that God's grace is sufficient for whatever you might be going through for this day. Let's all stand together. Why don't you sing, Ben? You come forward if you want prayer, and then after we sing this chorus, I'll pray for those who are gathered here. So you come as we sing. Come on. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. Come on. Come forward. Everything I need is in you.
prayed for you if you're still walking. I just want to have a word of prayer for everybody here who's come forward. You know, God knows our story, and God is the one who writes the last chapter. And so in the meantime, we just need to pray together as a congregation for those who have come forward here. And let's just ask God to minister His grace where needed most, because God knows. So let's just come together as a church. I'm going to pray for these who have walked forward here. Come on, church, you just pray with me. Just join your hearts as I, as I pray. Lord, I, I thank you that we can call you Father. And Lord, I thank you that even when things don't always turn out the way we had hoped, we trust you as Lord and God and Savior. David would pray, when my heart grows faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. So Lord, we trust that you are that rock. And for all these who have walked forward here who just need an extra measure of your grace today, Lord, I pray that you would pour out your ministering grace, your healing balm, your love, Lord, to their hearts, that you would overwhelm them with your presence, that you would overwhelm them with your strength, with your grace, with your peace. Lord, we don't pretend to have all the answers in this side of heaven. There are a lot of things that are confusing to us. But Lord, I pray in Jesus' name and we as a congregation for all those who have walked forward that you would do your good work in their hearts and lives. Where there's disappointment, Lord, that you would flood them with your grace. Where there has been a, a letdown in life that you would minister, Lord, your love your peace. We are weak, Lord, in ourselves, but in our weakness, your power is made perfect. So glorify yourself even in our weakness. Manifest your glory even in our weakness. And visit us, Lord, in a very personal and powerful way. You know every situation here, Lord. It's not a mystery to you. And we're going to trust that you will also in a wonderful way, minister to their hearts. We trust you, Lord. We fall forward. We run to you. We lean into you, Lord. We look for what you are doing instead of just the thing that you're not. And we hold on to eternity because we know in time we will know all things fully even as we are fully known. But meanwhile, Lord, we cling to you we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing this chorus again. You all can return to your seats. Let's sing this chorus again. Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough for me. And everything I need. Lord, that we trust you, that you are enough, that you're sufficient, Lord, for all of our days, for all of our questions, for all of our disappointments, Lord. But we learn from the Palm Sunday story. Unmet expectations are sometimes a reality in our lives, but Lord, may it not move us away from you. May it move us toward you as we trust you. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said. Amen.